Thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, if you will join me briefly for a Black History Month tribute. A proclamation, President Lincoln legally ended slavery on January 1st, 1863 by declaring free all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States. Slavery ended, but not slave-like working conditions that free men and women were forced to accept. Without land, food, shelter, money, or clothing, many former slaves were forced to remain on the plantation. Jubilation was short-lived for many. They called it Jubilee, the day that freedom came. It came almost 300 years after almost 300 years of cruel bondage and deaf ears refusing to hear my people's cries. It came after millions had died in chains and tens of thousands had perished on the battlefield. It came after the advancement of Union troops and the defeat of Confederate regiments. But to most, at least in spirit and in principle, it came with the Emancipation Proclamation the presidential edict that declared my people henceforth and forever free. News of President Lincoln's plan to free the slaves traveled quickly among my people. It sped along the plantation grapevine through conversations overheard in the big house and carried to the slave quarters. My people received the news cautiously wondering if the president would go through with his plan. But Lincoln was determined. Slavery had divided the nation and, and cost millions in lives. On January 1, 1863, President Lincoln signed the final draft of the Emancipation Proclamation. In it, he named the states and portions of states that were still in rebellion and declared those in bondage free. Nothing could match the euphoria, witnesses tell, of the day that the president signed the Emancipation Proclamation. In the nation's capital, my people filled the streets, the town halls, the African churches, praying, praising, and thanking God. They had lived to see this long-awaited day. Old women sang and testified. Old men wept openly. At coastal ports in the South, freedmen came from miles around to attend Jubilee celebrations, complete with parades, speeches, and feasts. The crowds were deeply touched when at first an old man and then several black men and women sang, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. Capturing the sacred mood of the day, in a way no speeches could. But as great as the edict was, the, emancip the Emancipation Proclamation was far from perfect. First, the president declared only those slaves in the Confederate states where he had no authority and left in bondage nearly a million in the portions of Tennessee, Louisiana, and Virginia under Union control. Second, since slaveholders were not about to let their bondsmen walk off merely because the North's president had declared them free, freedom would come when and if the Union defeated the South or if the enslaved escaped behind Union lines. Third, if people were waiting for the emancipation to strike a moral chord against slavery, they were disappointed. Twice the president mentioned that the action was taken as a necessary war measure for suppressing the rebellion. Still, with all of its shortcomings, my people greeted it as a long-awaited godsend. It may not have been all that learned men had hoped for, but it was more than the common slave ever dreamed. Celebrations lasted from New Year's Eve to the dawn of the Day of Emancipation. On April 9, 1865, the Civil War ended. Yet the issue of freedom and equality for the black man would continue to divide the nation. What freedom was, was like and what it would bring to my people was not yet known. But they knew that slavery's chains had been broken. 
from the cotton plantations of the Deep South to the rice fields of the coastal states, there rose a freedom song. No more drivers lash for me. No more, no more. No more drivers lash for me. Many thousands gone. I thank you for your attention. I yield the well.